This is Mrs. O'Neill for AP Chemistry, Chapter 12, all of it at one shot because we're only doing parts of each of those sections. So here I have certain pages for you to read that correspond to the material that you'll need to know. So this chapter is on solids and modern materials. Modern devices like computers and cell phones are built from solids with very specific physical properties. For example, the integrated circuit that is at the heart of many electronic devices is built from semiconductors like silicon, metals like copper, and insulators like hafnium oxide. Hard drives, which store information in computers and other devices, consist of a thin layer of magnetic alloy deposited on glass substrate. So your objectives for this chapter will be to classify solids based on their bonding, which that you've already done in Chem 1, but we're also going to include now these IMFs that you just learned. You're going to have to predict properties of these ionic solids based off of their ionic radii and empirical formula. Destri describe the difference between alloys, and there are two types. Explain the strength of molecular solids, again, based on their IMFs. And this is going to be the new part of the chapter. This is going to be the new material that you need to learn. These understanding of covalent network solids and understanding how they are gigantic molecules of covalent bonds, and they also have their own certain properties. So most of this chapter you already learned. It's going to be a review. But this covalent network solid has come up many times on the AP exam, and that's why I want to make sure that we're understanding all of these bond types, all of these um types of bonds and especially understanding these covalent network solids. So as always, I strongly suggest to pause the video, fill in the blanks, and then play to hear my words. So most of this you already know. You know how to classify solids based on their physical properties of their structures and then determine that bond type and what, what will form. So you know ionic solids are metal with a nonmetal or that polyatomic ion with a nonmetal. You know that your molecular solids are nonmetals combined or your diatomic molecules. Your atomic solids are your atoms and of course your metallic solids are your metals. Now this is going to be the new guy, your network covalent solids. And it gets a little tricky because some of your network covalent solids are atoms and some of your network covalent solids are molecules. But together they form a gigantic molecule that is kind of like holding hands like water, like I've always said, right? They, uh, water holds hands and that's why they have strong hydrogen bonds and they make that, that layer on top, that's that surface uh, surface temperature. So these network covalent solids, they're called that because of the way they're structured, because of the way those atoms and molecules are structured together, make them have a different kind of property than your normal molecular solid. So there are five types of solids. The first one is metallic, or it's called metals. They are a sea of those valence electrons. Those electrons are constantly moving, so they are strong conductors of electricity. Ionic solids are going to be that attraction between your positive cations and your negative anions. Now this is the new guy, your covalent network. It's extended network of those covalent bonds. They're very, very hard. They're usually semiconductors and they usually con uh, contain a metalloid. But here we have two 3D covalent network solids and actually both of them are just carbon. One of them is your carbon graphite and one of them is your carbon diamond and we're going to see that uh, soon in the future. But because of the way they are structured and put together, they become rigid and hard because of those bond angles. They are covalent bonds, but because of the way they are again bonded together as a whole network, they have different properties than your normal covalent or molecular solid. So again, your molecular solid, they're held together by IMFs. They're weak, they're soft, they have low melting points. Okay, so those are going to look very similar, right? They are non-metals, very similar to your covalent carbon graphite. But because of the way they're put together, they are put into two different categories and because of their properties. 
So I would pause, look this over, giving the description, giving a nice picture, and giving some examples of each of those solids that we just talked about. Then the last type are polymers. Uh, there's a whole section in your organic chapter 24. We did not go into great detail, but you do see these. And we've talked about how a non-polar molecule like methane and how it changes its polarizability when it goes from 1C to 2Cs to 3Cs to 10Cs to 20Cs. And as you get more and more Cs, carbons together in those long chains, they now become polymers. And because they are polymers, they are used, again, for different things because they have different properties than your normal methane, right? Than your normal just covalent bond. So now let's look at each of them in a little bit more detail. Again, I'll go through these kind of quickly. The metallic bond, again, are those valence electrons, and they're delocalized. And delocalized just means those electrons are not part of any one atom. They are kind of floating around, spreading around, going from one atom to one, one another. They are not being shared by atoms. They are not being transferred by atoms. They're just kind of there all over the place, and that's why they can conduct electricity very well. So again, here are your properties, which you already know from Chem 1. They're usually very, very closely packed together, those atoms. And again, they're usually called an electron C model or a C of valence electrons, and that's what I say in Chem 1. Those electrons are just moving around. So what's so special is these alloys when we have a mixture of metals. But don't get hung up on just a mixture of metals. Some of these alloys have non-metals with them. So if you notice steel here and stainless steel, steel is iron. And iron is very, very strong. But you add that little bit of carbon to it and it makes it extra strong. Same thing with stainless steel. So you have some iron and chromium, which are your metals, but you add a little bit of carbon and it makes it just that much more strong or durable. Now there are two types of alloys. Substitutional, substitution or substitutional, SS, substitutional similar sized radii metals that are mixed together. And the other one is interstitial, interstitial. That means that one atom fits inside or into another atom. So that's why I have S and S for substitution would give you the similar or same size atoms that are together in that alloy. And interstitial, inter or inside, one atom can fit nicely inside the atom. So they have different sized um, radii. So pause the video, draw, just do a quick drawing of how gold and silver together would be the same size. That would be substitutional. And you have something like steel, you have carbon, which is a lot smaller atom than iron. So this would be interstitial because one is fitting inside the other. Your ionic solids, Again, most of this information you already know, but now let's look a little bit more in detail about the properties. So when you have something like sodium chloride, you have a melting point of 800, 801 versus magnesium oxide. Now you have a plus two versus a negative two. Your charges are different. And look what happens to that uh, melting point, right? Wow, does that skyrocket? Well, why does that happen? Again, the charge is gonna make the strength stronger between those atoms, which is gonna be harder to break or harder to spread out those um, molecules from each other. So again, as the ion size increase, your interaction decreases. So if we look at that top, LIF, lithium fluoride, you have a small compound or small ionic radii. You have short distance between them, which means your lattice energy is going to be strong. Now let me remind you, lattice energy is the amount of energy needed to take a solid LIF and break it up into its gaseous uh, ions. Um, it's going to have a high melting point then because, again, those IMFs are really, really strong versus RBI, not like the baseball, but rambidium iodine. Um, you have big atoms, which means your distance is longer. You have a weaker lattice energy, and that means that you're going to have a lower melt melting point because of weaker IMFs. So here, if we take another look at these 
um, ionic radii. Again, the higher the charge, you have plus one, negative one versus plus two, negative two. The higher the ion charge, the closer those atoms are going to be able to bond, which means the stronger they are. Again, you've seen maybe these ionic solids and the beautiful structures, um, the symmetrical way that they arrange themselves. Molecular solids, again, most of this we just learned in chapter 11 with IMFs. And this is an example of water. And again, your IMFs, but look at the way that those are structured together. So here again is a nice little recap and an example of each of the way those atoms will bond or, or structure themselves in a lattice, crystalline lattice. So this is the new guy, covalent network solids. They're gigantic, okay? They're usually a compound, but sometimes they're just an element in which those atoms are bonded. Again, they're covalently bonded, but it's a continuous network throughout that material. So there really are no just individual molecules like your carbon dioxide that kind of floats around in the in your air, right, as, as we're breathing it in. It is now, you know, carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide all built into one. Um, so the entire crystal or the entire solid is really considered a macro molecule. So because of that, they have a higher melting point. They are usually very, very hard and they're stiff and brittle. So they will break into pieces rather than just kind of smooth shaping them. So here's your example again of that diamond and graphite. So both of these are considered a covalent network solid because see how they are structured together. It's not just one molecule, it's that whole macro molecule put together. And here are two other examples in the middle here, the silicon dioxide and silicon carbide. So you can have just elements being um, covalent network solids and you can have compounds being covalent network solids. So it just depends on how they are structured and put together. But those are two, especially silicon dioxide. I've seen that on the AP exam uh, quite often. So the rest are five videos. You will get extra credit, one point each video of, with a total of five points. I don't give you much extra credit, so take this opportunity. Each of these explains each of those solids in a little bit more detail, and I just strongly suggest, even if you don't want to watch all five, watch the one about the covalent network solids and the metallic solids. The metallic solids talk about those two different kinds of alloys. That's new material for you, and the covalent network work solids obviously is very new material for you. So if nothing else, watch those two and get yourself at least two extra bonus points. Um, but again, it doesn't look like much here, maybe 20 minutes of your time to watch all four of them um, to get a better understanding of this overall material. Okay, we will see you in class to do book work. And then I have practice AP questions for you uh, that deals with all of these types of solids and especially that network, uh, that covalent network solid.